to speak. Yeah, it's been a while. How have you been? You living down in Orlando, you experience pretty much the same thing as me, right? It's horrible down there right now, isn't it? Or are you guys doing okay? Well, I mean, it doesn't really feel that much different except for we wear masks now. Um, Disney Springs was a little bit post-apocalyptic. Um, and uh, Publix only lets you go one way down an aisle, but that's about, that's about it. Like pretty much everything's open. Um, still just as busy as always, and you just have to wear masks now. So, yeah. I can't remember last time we had a conversation. I think I was still in New Jersey. Yeah, it's been a long time. Um, what has been going on with you and uh, it's Raven Tree, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the uh, the final episode in the series actually just published today. Uh, so I am officially done with the series, uh, 15 episodes in all, three seasons. Um, so that's finished. And then October 3rd, uh, the complete collection of season three and the, the final paperback will be out. So I'm kind of uh, running a promo, kind of celebrating all through the end of October. Oh, good for you. And it's a perfect yeah. month for it too, right? It's kind of hot. Yes, exactly. That was Is the plan from the beginning. Is it witches yeah. and stuff? What was it again? Or haunting? Ghost what stories. Ghost stories. Yeah. And how big were the seasons? I can't remember. Each season is, is five episodes. What's so, what was an episode? Um, and an episode is about 10,000 words. So it's a short story. Short, no. 50,000 yeah. is novel. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, so yeah. all together, they equal a novel. So it's three yeah. novels. So it's basically a trilogy if you're looking at paperbacks, you know, you're going to get three paperbacks, but each one is, is um, separated into five different episodes instead of chapters. So um, you have all this stuff now, what do you do with it? Do you think of it as just a thing that you've published and you're never going to think about it again? Or in your mind, are you like, okay, I have it out there in the world, but I want to eventually adjust it and make it different? Yeah, well, I mean, this is my first finished series. Um, so I, it is taking a little bit of, of thought to think about how I'm going to keep using this. Um, I don't want it just to like drift off into my backlist and not ever be seen again. So part of it is building my overall brand and my overall career. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking, you know, if I enjoy this and I have people who are reading these horrors, I do intend to kind of branch out more on this gothic horror vein so mo more ghost stories more like monster stories um but my main focus is going to be my cyberpunk so you know i have plans for more things in the future um and then i definitely have ideas for what i'd like to do to continue working with the raven tree society and not just kind of letting it fade away um so for right now uh i have the paperbacks um i've been doing a lot of art around those Oh, okay. So the two solid plans that I have right now is, is uh, I would like to put them all together in a collection uh, in hardback and then have it illustrated with my own illustrations. So I have uh, character art. I have the cover art for the three seasons. And then I was probably going to do some um, pen and ink illustrations of just a few of the ghosts. Uh, so... Yeah, oh, so, so I'm that's planning on doing that. So you are going to put it online, or are you going to publish it also? Well, uh, I probably won't put that one out in ebook. My plan is to make that a little bit more specialized to kind of uh, make the effort of creating it more worthwhile. And then I'm also planning on branching out into some um, some live events next year. So probably starting nice and small with like a farmer's market or something like that. But that gives... Uh, an extra added benefit for the people who are able to meet me in person or mm -hmm. for instance I might put them on my website and, and make it available for like a signed edition because it would be a little bit more expensive to create a hardback uh, but it also creates kind of a collector's item and, and something a little bit more valuable than just uh, the, the you know quick printouts that you would get from Amazon so it's just one way to kind of add value to to the IP that's interesting. So uh, you have a, a group now, don't you? Publishing together with a bunch of friends. 
Yeah, okay. um, what, what I'm part of a writer's it? collective. Yeah, what, what, so, give a name, what's it called? Yeah, we call it, we call it a marketing collective and it's the Phoenix Fiction Writers. Um, so Phoenix it's focused fiction on- Phoenix Fiction Writers, that's right. That's, yeah. It's alliterative. <laughs> yes, yes. It's focused specifically on science fiction and fantasy, so it doesn't include my Raven Tree Society um, internet, uh, intellectual property. It focuses, um, right now I have my malfunction series in there, and then we put out a anthology every year. So we actually just put out our anthology last month as well, and I had a piece in that, my first published fantasy, actually. How, how long have you guys been doing this together? For about two years now, or about a year and a half or so? It's, it's our third year anniversary. Third year, um, coming up in December, I want to say. Does it make um, it easier, do you think, having a bunch of people doing the marketing at this point? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's positives and there's negatives. Um, some of the positives are that, uh, you know, the majority of people right now who are interacting with me and my Discord, on my coffee, like um, some of my biggest readers and fans come to me through the Phoenix Fiction Writers. And they're a really valuable group to have because they're, they're super fans. Um, and of course, there's the added value of, of, you know, as an author, especially as an indie author, you're expected to put out high quality content, but you're also expected to put it out really rapidly. And it yeah. used to be that you could be expected to put out like a book a year, um, which can still be a lot for you know, especially for someone like me who's working, uh, you know, 50 hours a week and who's writing content that's like for my science fiction, because it's hard science fiction. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of research. Um, so it can be hard to put those out at that rate. So it's beneficial to have another group in which you're kind of sharing the burden so that it's not, your readers aren't expecting you to have something at the rate of, you know, some authors are doing it like once a month at this point. Once a month? Um, That's what people are doing? One, a novel a month? Yeah, it's insane. So obviously um, there's a lot of single authors who can't keep up with that. And especially if you still have a full-time job or, you know, have any sort of life at all. <laughs> That's ridiculous though. I mean, what kind of quality is going into these novels? Are they just complete crap? Are we talking about romance or are these speculative fiction works? Well, I mean, romance, romance readers read a lot. Um, the average romance reader reads, I don't know. I, I think some people were saying up to five books a day for some of them. A lot uh, of them though are not necessarily what you would call a strenuous reading. No. Right? I mean, they're, they're very, very, if that's what we're talking about. One book a month for a romance, it's not that bad. Yeah. And, and of course we're talking about a shorter book. So uh, my books, my um, cyberpunk books average about nine to a hundred thousand words. <clears throat> so I'm looking at backing that down in my next series to be closer to to 50 to 70,000 words. Um, but, you know, we are talking about me. I, I probably will go overboard and end up back in a 90,000 word range. Um, but I will do my best. You also publish pretty rapidly, though, too, which is interesting. I, it might look so to Well, to, to me, because I, I write novels, and they sit and they collect dust, and then I rewrite novels, and they sit and collect dust. To, to, yeah. I, I wrote um, Sounds of Nothing, which you read. I want yeah. to make it speculative so bad. So it's been sitting there for so long, trying to work on that angle. So now finally I'm able to get back into it. I was going to publish it as yeah. it was. I was like, yeah, screw it. Let's go put it out there and let the world decide exactly what it is. But yeah. I figured out an element, you know? I mean, this is years. This is a story that I've worked on 15 years ago. Yeah. You know what I want? It's like 15 years later, I finally, oh, okay. This is interesting. I'm so happy I didn't waste it on publishing it when I first yeah. wrote it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you, I mean, cause my, my catalog is huge. I just haven't put anything out. Yeah. And you said put stuff out rapidly. So if you can put stuff out rapidly that you've thought about for a really long time, it would be interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of authors are doing that now. Um, I've, I've also known a few authors who they'll take a year or two off and they'll, build up a lot of books and that's still writing pretty rapidly, but yeah. they'll build up, you know, between three to five books and then they'll publish them, you know, within two weeks to a month. Um, and then I have uh, one of 
my first author friends, uh, Sarah K. L. Wilson, she actually does novellas. Um, yeah. So they're, I think they average like. She's been on the show, hasn't she? Oh yeah, she's great. Yeah. I love her. Um, she averages about 25,000 words, I think. Um, 25,000 words at one what? point. A month? Sorry, what was that? 25,000 words of what, a month? She was at one point putting out, I, I think those ones were close to the Dragon School ones were close to 15,000, if I remember correctly. 15,000. Um, but she was putting those out every two weeks. Um, Which is interesting. That, She's publishing those on Amazon every two weeks. Yes. And seeing yeah. results off of those short pieces. Oh, of yes. Really? Yeah. And they're all oh, major results. Like she's done very well for herself, specifically with the, the Dragon School. So, oh, yeah, the Dragon School. I remember this conversation. This is a yeah. while ago. She's a very, very nice lady. Yeah. Um, she's pretty great. Um, but people are gobbling them up and demanding more and more. Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah. And I guess you were kind of doing something similar with Raven Tree, putting out smaller chops of, or smaller bites of, uh, of work. Yeah, I was, I was kind of experimenting with that. Um, I think I found it wasn't incredibly useful with the Raven Tree Society. Mm. Um, I think there's multiple factors that go into that, not the least of which being the genre. Um, but what I, would I think found... the genre is like, like romance, like, like suspense or thrillers. People just love that stuff and, you know, just tear into it. Yeah, you'd think so. I was thinking that horror was probably a little bit more of a hungry category because I know a lot of people who really enjoy horror. Mm. Um, but I think, and I think part of it might be a uh, lack of marketing mm. um, correctly because a lot of that has to be done in conjunction with paid marketing, which I haven't really dipped my toe into that yet. Um, so that might be part of it is that kind of my existing pool of readers. Um, and a Who's lot of them successful? are kind of like. Who's successful in the horror indie genre right now? Do you know of anybody that, that you would be in like indies? aiming for who? In indies? Yeah. I so can't. Specifically. Like, yeah. Indies. I can't pull one up off the top of my head as far as indies. Um, I know several who write in kind of a blend of genres. Um, and I couldn't come up with their names off the top of my head. I'd have to look them up. What um, I appreciate about what you're doing, though, is yet you're committed to getting stuff out there. I really yeah. think that's important. Um, like, I, I get a stakes right. You know, I just don't want to send it out there incomplete or with mistakes or issues or whatnot. Um, but the more you do it, the stronger you get and the easier it is to actually produce that type of stuff. My idea is now you're a publisher. You're a publisher. Do you, call, do you mm -hmm. call yourself that? Well, I think, yeah, I wouldn't call myself. You wouldn't? At a publisher? wouldn't you do call myself though, that. You? Yes, I, would, I call myself a, an indie author. I, I like that term. But my mentality is that of a publisher because it's a combination of things. Yeah, um, but, you know, if I frame myself. Right? Yeah, if I frame myself as a publisher, then there's a certain territory that comes with that if you frame yourself as a publisher. And we've experienced that even in Phoenix Fiction where we're a marketing collective for indie authors, but there are people who contact us looking to get their stuff published through us because that's the mentality they have of, of a publisher. And there are indie authors who do that sort of thing, but it's just not a good route to take a marketing wise to, to identify yourself as that uh, but it's a good mentality mentality to have because then you can separate kind of the more artistic side from yeah. trying to actually make money off of your art, which artistic can be side, really right? difficult. It's yeah. really hard. It's really hard. I've had the idea of maybe putting just more fiction on my website yeah. and treating it more of like a magazine, you know, if I could yeah. get other people to put their stuff out there. But it's it's really hard to do stuff. It all takes it time. Is. I mean, yeah. if you, like you have kids that you look after, you're nine, mm -hmm. 50 hours a week. I have kids. I have yeah. twins that are all over me now. They're five years old. Forget about yeah. it. I, I wake up early as hell in the morning so I can beat them just a little bit, you know, before they wake up and get some stuff done. But once they're awake, I might be able to edit a sentence or put a picture in a place that I want it to be. Yep. It's, it's almost virtually impossible to do anything else but that. Yeah. Um, I mean, just imagine other people sending you their work and going, hey, is this picture perfect for a mass audience to enjoy? No, probably not. I don't have the time to devote to you and what problems you might have. It's hard to yeah. find them. 
it's hard. And then when you find 10, you find 20 more. Yeah. God. Yeah, there's, there's a huge pool of people who are wanting to have a publisher and who are specifically, like I see a lot of the, a lot of the mentality is not wanting to do the work themselves, which makes sense, but it's, it's hard. It's not it's hard. realistic because even if you go with yeah. a traditional publisher, most of them are not going to do much for marketing for you. They're going to expect but you right to now, do the majority of marketing yourself. That's yeah. why they go after a certain type of person. I mean, yeah. they're not dumb. You look on Twitter, you see the people that are following like a hundred writers or whatever who are following, and then they get followed by five thousand people. They're they all look a certain way. Yeah. You know, they they have a, a thing, I guess you could say, that works. Yeah, and the, it is. I mean, you, you have to understand that they are, um, they're a business and they're going to behave like a business because they have to stay afloat. So even if they are going to publish things that they love, those things that they love are going to be passion product uh, projects and they're going to have to be paid for by a whole bunch of stuff that they think they can sell. So you though too, right? I mean, let's talk about Phoenix fiction writers. Yeah. You guys consider each other a product. I mean, when I, when I think of Parazi, I think of the person that I'm able to talk to and about um, her religion and how it influences her art and what she's doing on the publishing side. Are you a product? Does that, is that what you bring to? I think it can be dangerous to, to go too far for that mentality. Um, and, and it can be hard to, to learn where to draw the line. Um, so my role in the Phoenix Fiction Writers is I'm the managing editor. So I'm, I'm basically, uh, you know, we don't really have more, a structure or more of um, a group think, more of like a think tank. But we do have, um, I'm, if, if you could put me anywhere, I'm kind of second in command. I just kind of, uh, and I don't even want to say command because we don't really boss each other around kind of deal. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of, I guess, second in the role of like how much I take on. So one of the major things I do is I, um, I look at authors and see who we want to, to try to bring into the collective next. Um, and so it, it helps, especially in that sense, to be able to separate the person and be like, okay, look, there are these positive things about this person in particular because they have to work well with a group. But then to also look at and be like, okay, this is the kind of stuff they write. Does it line up with, um, with our mission statement? And then also, will it be helpful to the other authors? Because we pull in, like for instance, um, we had my horror up there for a while and we kind of all agreed, look, we're science fiction and fantasy. No one else writes horror. No one writes else writes scary things. So not only is my are my books not helpful, my horror books not helpful to that the collective in that way, but the collective is also not going to be helpful for my horror books because we're not we're not attracting readers who want to read horror. You know. Um, so yeah, it it can be a a careful line to walk to be able to understand. Okay where do I as the author stop and where do I as the product begin? Um, well, it's interesting because it sounds like the idea is this thing that you're developing, this fiction, the Phoenix Fiction Workshop, is a machine that's supposed to be churning out a product. And if you thought that it was working for the fantasy and the science fiction, maybe you could turn your eye towards finding other horror writers to do something similar. You know, they don't want to write science fiction or fantasy, but you could use the skills that you, you know, develop yeah. making this happen and making something else happen. And that's what's fascinating, right? Because you're not actually stuck being one thing. You could be many things. And it's awesome yes. that you have many different aspects of your writing happening here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Genre is stupid. I don't like it. <laughs> genre is the library system, which is fine. The li yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a marketing is the concept. Book, it's the bookshop concept, right? I mean, it's the yeah. thing with the pretty picture on the back of the book. Write a good story, put a good package together. And then the marketing thing, I don't know clue. I have no earthly <laughs> idea. Because, I mean, honestly, it only matters for, like, while you're struggling to develop a community. 
once you have a legion of people who want you to write the next book, it doesn't matter anymore about marketing. Yeah. You put a tweet out and say, I have a book, 20,000 people, read it and pass it on to your friends. That's all the marketing you got to do for that piece of publication. But the question is, how do you develop the, the, the strength to when you wade into the pool, the water washes over to the sides like that? You know what I mean? Right now, you're not showing up. I'm not showing up. Yeah. I don't have any product out there for anybody to buy either right now, which is unfortunate. And every day that goes by that I don't have a product out there, it's like almost devastating. But you do have products out there, right? Yeah. You have products out there in the world. So that's very powerful. Yeah. I think my mentality is, is less, um, it, it can be hard to look at the vast amount of work that's out there right now. Um, especially but it's not your work, right? It's only your work that you're concerned about and how it matches yeah. up to that other work. And yeah. because like we said about the romance writer, readers, they're voracious. Yeah. They're voracious. God, they'll just get, they'll just dump book after book. How do you get your book underneath their hands so they can pick it up and start reading it? Do you yeah. not do paperbacks or do you? I do paperbacks, yes. Okay. Um, for the, not for everything. I think for me, it really depends on um, what the value of that is. But I, I do believe in multiple sources of income and using an, an intellectual property in as many ways as possible. So, you know, I have ebooks and I have paperbacks, but I'd also love to branch out into other directions as well because that intellectual property has value for multiple things. Some things in which, you know, I can't attain as a single individual author, like, you know, movies and video games. You're probably as an indie not going to develop, go into the corporate uh, video games and movies, right? But you can potentially serve other avenues. Yeah. I mean, well, go ahead. Like, one thing I've been doing um, for the the kind of celebration of the Raven Tree Society is I've partnered with uh, two candle makers, um, and one of which I, I commissioned the candles, and she provided the candles, and they're incredible. But she's running her own business, um, and then another one of which who has partnered with me on a more permanent basis, and she's going to be carrying those candles in her shop. She read all my books. Um, she looked through all my inspiration and she created sense based on that. And she would like to build off that in the future. And so we have started kind of a partnership that we're going to build on with that. So intellectual property, even these things that you wouldn't think of as being like, oh, books. Um, now, if someone goes to buy her candles because they like the idea of like a horror scent or they like her as a candle maker, now they're picking up <clears throat> something that could potentially lead them to my writing. Right. I mean, also as an artist, as a creator, you kind of aren't just pigeonholing yourself as a writer. You could look at this candle as an opportunity for storytelling as well. You said, yeah. did you call her a witch? W-I-T-C-H? Or cool. did you just, yeah, that's cool. So that's like, she found you through the books because of her own personal interest? I, I'm sorry, uh, the candle maker? Yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry if you misunderstood me there. Um, no, uh, as far as I know, neither of them <laughs> are, but, um, I commissioned both of them. Okay. Cool. Um, and That's then cool. one, one of them loved the idea of working with me on a more permanent basis. Because I could see that going, uh, helping you out with like in person stuff that you plan to do on like flea markets and maybe yeah. some cons down the road or something like that. And you have something Definitely. to show. And we've I, talked about a, all those possibilities. Like, I love going to cons. I love walking around, seeing stuff in the sad booths. So the ones that give that poor guy sitting there with four books going, oh, why is nobody talking to me? Exactly. But there's lively ones that are decorated and they have things. What's going on here? And the person jumps up and is excited to see you and maybe tries to shake your hand or something crazy. Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. No, you're bumping elbows. That's crazy. Has this, stupid, has this thing hap uh, impacted your writing at all? Have you thought of the world differently since April or March or whenever it actually affected you guys down there in Florida? I mean, yes and no. Um, I, am, I You definitely can't say that world events don't impact you. And 2020 has been packed full of world events and personal huh. events. Um, so, and um, I bulk at dissecting time in that way and being like hey 2020 is horrible but i mean i'm gonna join in the chorus here and say 2020 it's been a mess 
Um, so, you know, you definitely can't get away from that impact in your writing. Um, in some ways, it, it definitely, like I've had to give thought to it in ways that I haven't had to before. Um, like for instance, the, the short story that I wrote for the Phoenix Fiction Anthology that just came out um, of Myth and Monster. The short story uh, was, is a fantasy and it was kind of inspired by um, the Black Plague era. But this was like before COVID even hit America, before it was like in the news and I don't watch the news. So before it was like trending on Twitter and stuff like that, I don't notice. Um, which is probably horrible, but you know, that's how it is. Um, I, follow, I follow that thing in January when it started happening. It's like my, my, my wife, were, something bad is gonna happen. Then my entire family got sick within like a week. It was like, boom, 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 boom. It was like, holy shit, <laughs> what's yeah. going on? And then all of a sudden the city's closed down. I was like, yeah, I, I called this all the way back in January, people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, we, we were all sick down here in December, and I wonder if that was what it was. But me and my husband have both. You didn't have, I have no antibodies, so I don't so. know if you had, I had it or not, right? It's yeah, like crazy. exactly. Who no knows? Antibodies. I'm back when we were getting sick. Like, my husband and I both got sick at the beginning of this, um, and he actually tested a positive for COVID. He did. Um, he did. So he's had it. I have had it at least once. I'm sure, even though I didn't get sick at the same time he did. There's it like no way. like crazy fast and it's so yeah. contagious. You had to have had it. If you had any impact, you know, if you were talking to him at all, like a six foot radius. Exactly. Know. But it's, you know, it's hard to tell as well because um, my lungs are so bad that even if I get like a regular cold, um, I have trouble breathing. So <laughs> I could be like, hey, it was COVID. But then I had COVID like three times last year too. So, um, and when I had gotcha. it, there was, there were no tests available unless you were like on death's doorstep. Right. So I just took two weeks off work. You know, back then we didn't even know what the impact would be. And then it's coupled with all this political drama too, right? You're not sure what's happening, what's the truth, what's actually going on. Is this a ploy by the right or a ploy by the left? Is it foreign powers? Is it war? You know what I mean? It's so fantastic and interesting. And yeah. you don't have any idea actually what's happening. Like you said, you don't watch the news. You can't even read about the news, right? You can't even pick up a newspaper and go, aha, now I know what's happening. No, you're probably just skewed towards whatever direction that newspaper wants you to be skewed in. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely insane. Yeah, and I mean, you can find a study that supports anything, anything. these days. I mean, that's, that's the wonder of the internet. Um, wear a mask. Has... Don't wear a mask. Wear 12 masks. It doesn't matter what you do. Uh, take vitamin yeah. D. Yeah, it's like crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's been so many like cures um, announced or, you know, just take this colloidal silver or whatnot. Um, so, yeah, it, it really is. I, yeah, works. basically, if it, if it comes, for me, if it comes down to, if there's a simple answer, then I don't believe it, because life is not simple. So if we're going to just say, like, you know, the right takes it to their, their extreme, and, and I'm just like, okay, well, it's not that simple, and the left takes it to their extreme, and I'm like, you know, it's not that simple either. The answer is probably somewhere in the middle, and neither, you know, both and neither. I don't know. I mean, it honestly looks like the man in the White House right now is trying to take over our country in some kind of huge facet, fascist coup. And I'm not quite sure if that's happening or that's some kind of narrative that I've constructed in my own head because I'm the one that's telling the news right now. You know what I mean? I'm controlling what I watch and what I view. It's like, I'm just looking for that stuff. I'm just cherry picking. Huh. Emperor Trump stuff. Yeah, there is, there is an interesting um, TED Talk. Uh, so it sounds like such a cliche when I say that. There is an interesting TED Talk I listened to. It was a, no, you, you would have been cliche like five years ago. Now it's retro to talk about TED Talk. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a man, he was left-leaning, but he decided to kind of step out of things and, and start joining some 
right-leaning Facebook groups. Um, yep. And it didn't really change his views much um, other than he was able to say, you know, these people aren't as horrible as, as I thought they were. Um, but he had a very interesting thing to say about, you know, how the internet in particular creates these echo chambers where the more we look for what we want to hear, yeah. the more the computer tailors the algorithms to that, the more we're going to hear what we want to hear. And so we can, you know, create our own proof to support our own beliefs and never step outside of that and see the other point of view because we're only getting our information from the internet. Um, where in reality is, you know, if you're able to talk to some people just on the street, the majority of times the stuff you're hearing on the internet is, especially on Twitter, um, and I'm backed up from Twitter a lot because it was just so overwhelming this year and so dramatic. Um, <laughs> but it, yeah, it can be, it can be really skewed, um, you know, which isn't Personal to say that I've personal, How you see things, it could be skewed just like that. Yeah, um, yeah, it's so fascinating. Like I have, I really like the idea of math. Yeah, like you could put equations together and and potentially figure out a really complex answer. Yeah, and I found myself like in April or May, like wishing that I could figure out what was going on based on the information I already had because nothing made sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like I'm old, forty three, and like my entire life has never been this confusing where you're just not certain what's happening. It's so just convoluted. Yeah. As a speculative fiction author, you cannot do anything but speculate too. You know what yeah. I mean? So you're, you're adding all this layer of fiction on top of it as well. It's an interesting lens to see it through. Um, and also, you know, as someone who has a love for history and a love for, for philosophy and all these other things, theology, um, it is interesting. I, I've been listening to, um, uh, I'm currently listening to on, on audiobook um, Bonhoeffer by, uh, I believe his first name is Eric Metaxas. And then also, I keep calling it Calculating Stars, but it's not. That's a fiction that was somewhat inspired by it. Um, uh, Hidden Figures um, by Margot Lee Shetterly. I think I'm saying her name correctly. Hidden Figures um, is a movie just recently too, right? It was about the African Yeah, it was a movie women. based off of real historical events. The book is um, basically just following uh, some of the pioneer, specifically black um, women in first NASA. the- um, NACA. Is it NACA yes. or NASA? NACA. NACA. Yeah. NACA. So, um, so it follows first kind of World War era where they're able to get their foot in the door both as women and as black women specifically, um, working with, uh, with airplanes and with the Air Force in World War II um, and then follows through. So it's interesting because you're actually seeing the American side um, from World War II and then also seeing the German side and from different perspectives because Bonhoeffer was, um, he was a pastor in Germany um, when Hitler came to power, um, and he ended up actually being, uh, actually joining a plot to overthrow Hitler and ultimately kill him, and uh, Bonhoeffer was found out and caught and, and put to death for that. Um, this is then, so cool that you mentioned this guy, because I wanted to bring up your list of seven people that you've- Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know why I he's on the list. Yeah, right. I did. I Googled him, you know, briefly. I looked at his Wikipedia thing over on the left and or the right hand side of my screen. And yeah, no, oh, cool. He saved some Jewish people during World War II. And I X'd out of it. And to think that he actually, he helped rocketry, right? And he built is that what's going on? No, no, oh, not at um, all. I, I think for me, the it, the the interest is an opposite opposite side of experience, human experience, and and political spectrum because you, you see, like Bonhoeffer was extremely inspired theologically by the African American plight when he came to visit America, and he brought that experience back with him to Germany, and that experience helped form his perspective when German when Hitler in specific started moving against the Jewish people in Germany. 
Um, so it's kind of interesting seeing the opposite experiences of the black women in America in the same time period as, you know, a white um, German man who actually had quite a bit of power in Germany. Um, and, and yeah, it's just interesting seeing the politics around that. Um, so it was yeah, interesting it, seeing some of those names on your list because I, when I was doing the Googling and my very, very little bit of reading on each one of them, it yeah. almost seemed like you could write some really fantastic literature with these people as subject matter. Yeah, well, I mean, could the majority of them are, are authors um, of some of the most profound theological books in existence. Um, There's nothing more fitting to like a gothic horror story than a Baptist preacher, right? <laughs> powerful orator comes rambling into the building and ready to save lives or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. I just like the idea of it. Yes, gothic gothic literature, gothic horror in specific is very heavy with religious themes, which is probably why I love it so much. And um, set it in Florida among yeah. the, the Spanish moss and the freaking unfortunate humidity and the, 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 the history. You know what I've read recently? Florida is the has the like the fewest number of large land owning families in the country. Like the fewest number of people own the most land in Florida than anywhere else in the entire United States. And that, <laughs> that makes that's sense. It. Does it? it? Does cause I grew up there and I didn't realize that it was that much old money. I grew up in, you know, Pasco County, which is on the Gulf Coast. And I guess if I look back on my memory, there's tons of pasture land, like all yeah. over the place. I don't even know if I would call it old money. I think it's just because Florida is, there's so much swamp and everything is underwater. That uh, if you're going to be able to raise cattle or anything else, you have to own a lot of land. <laughs> so yeah, it's right. like, okay, if you're going to be able to make a livelihood in this area at all, which a lot of Florida is country. Um, yes, we have some big cities, but a lot of it is country. Um, you know, you country, have- yeah. You have land which is next to the ocean and all salty and you can't use that for much. Or you can like raise your cattle and you know, they're gonna be underwater half the year. <laughs> so yeah. That's interesting. So like the fewest people that own the most land in our country as well. Yeah. That That's sense. fascinating to me. Um, so I mean Orlando, are you still in Orlando? Uh close by. Close by. How yeah, how's it doing? Is it is it a is it a ghost town? Are they are they surviving? Is it is it business as usual or is it like like ninety percent of New York City restaurants are closing down? Yeah, it's business that as usual. Is it business um, as usual? It's crazy. We had about two weeks where everything shut down. Yeah. Um, and even then, like there was, I think there was one moment that was a little bit surreal to me when I went into a Publix and like there was barely anyone there. And everyone was giving everyone else the side eye. And that was even before we were doing masks. So there was a few people with masks, but for the most part, like everyone was just like glaring as you, at you as you walked past, which is the opposite of Southern hospitality, um, especially in public of all places. But uh, it, was, it was a very interesting experience. It kind of, and you know, so the shelves are all empty and we're all like glaring at each other as we like, you know, try to fight over toilet paper from six feet apart um, interesting. so that was that was a interesting experience but after that yeah it's everything opened right back up um a lot of the restaurants were doing curb service but you know they're back in in business now you can go in just fine as long as you have a mask on until you sit down um and they're not even separating the tables that far apart anymore they were for a while and now they've they've gotten it to the point where you know they have like shields up and stuff like that um so that they can still see people it's crazy it feels like it's still going on up here like it hasn't stopped the whole summer it was masks masks have not come off since like eight may something yeah. like that yeah. like i said like 90 percent of all businesses are almost going out of business it feels like we're just being stepped on up here to kill us to get us to get out of the city or something because it's like 30 yeah there's of, a like, lot the of people a lot of people coming down to florida from yeah, that, that area um and I also that. i i think most of california is emptying out into texas and most of new york is like emptying out into florida which does 
it happens this time of year anyways. I tried um, to I tried to talk my wife into going. I was like, let's go to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go yeah. down there. It's gonna be nice. She won't do it. She hates Florida. She can't stand it. I hate Florida too, but I mean, right now I'm kind of like, yay, Florida, you're not like stifling us. I mean, there's still issues. Um, there's still difficulties, I should say, not issues. There's still difficulties. Um, I know a lot of, a lot of churches are shutting down around here. Um, we've had some of difficulties with my church of finding a place to, to meet specifically. Um, and there, so there's definitely places struggling yeah. Um, it's not like it hasn't impacted anyone at all. There's definitely a lot of people struggling. There's a lot of homeless people down here right now. I don't doubt it. Um, there's going to be more, like I too. Said, this time of year, anyways. Yeah, yeah there's going to be more. There's going to be more. But that there's happens this time of year, have, anyways. So. I heard a number. We have 70,000 homeless people in New York right now on the streets. 70,000. It's an impossible number. If you think about 70,000 people filling like Texas Stadium with the Dallas yeah. Cowboys play. That's how many homeless people we have, basically, just right now in New York City. And yeah. pretty soon it's going to be too cold for them, and they're going to go to other places, and it's all going to be in Florida. Yeah, well, that's when this whole, whole thing started, of course, and we didn't know what it was going to turn into, but my husband and I both kind of looked at each other, and we're like, okay, so what's going to happen with the homeless population, and what's going to happen with the imprisoned population? Like, the two of those in, in particular are kind yeah. of the hardest hit in a lot of this. Um, it's hard, course, right? Because yeah. you look at these people, I was in the East Village for a, for a few months, and uh, you walk by just the worst shape of human possible. You know, they look like they crawled out of some apocalypse. You know, they're black yeah. with soot. They're just covered in sores. They're barefoot sometimes. You know, they're completely, completely, like dangerous looking you know like you're yeah. never going to stop and talk to one of them and go hey buddy what's going on you look so sad no they look like they'll just knife you right there <laughs> yeah well i mean all the safety nets that we had are not working because of covid um we were not and yet. they're they're overtaxed and they're not able to provide the same level of hope that they were able to before because there's restrictions on that my um, thinking and then you, is that they were always there, these people, these shadows, the zombies, they were zombies. It felt like I was in a zombie movie forever. Like I'd walk my dog on, you know, Houston and First Avenue and be just sure I was going to get attacked. It was just miserable. Yeah. And the idea that I had was that these people were always there mixed in with all the regular people. You know, so it filtered it. So you saw lots of pretty people, lots of normal people that could block the sight of this person that was really struggling bad. 78,000 people mixed into a million people. It's a very insignificant number, right? It's one per 10%. That's almost it. Yeah. It's almost yeah. 10%. It's a ridiculously high number. It's, oh my God, it's sickening to think about how high 78,000 is. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's definitely a problem. It's uh, it's very sad. So let me ask issue. you: we uh, we elect you tomorrow. What do you do? Doesn't matter the office. Me? You're there. Yeah, you get to fix Give it. Give it to someone who would handle it better. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd be the perfect politician. That's exactly what all politicians do. As soon as they no, get in the office, they get no. to somebody else. <laughs> oh, I got elected. The job goes to you, Bob. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, nobody knows what the hell they're doing <laughs> yeah no i mean i i have i have my own personal opinions of what would be best for this country of course mm -hmm. um of of areas where i see we desperately need help but i also am aware that i personally am not equipped as a leader and um i i tend to either be steamrolled or steamroll people. Um, so I, I'm very much aware that there would be a lot of a lot of issues if I was put in office, and I don't I don't want any kind of position like that. You know. Um, I imagine yeah. you're an overthinker anyway, right? As an oh, author, right? Yes. <laughs> I think it's our thing. I'm an overthinker too. Actually, I just I I get myself into trouble thinking myself yeah. into problem, you know, holes or whatnot. But yeah. I mean, you have to be able to make. I also think that a genius level intellect is somebody that knows something very quickly, is able to 
act very quickly and get it right very quickly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but it doesn't mean you're wrong if you take a long time thinking about it because there's so many things to think about. Yeah. You make a good politician. I mean, you have to think in your work, you have to develop what a good politician is anyway, right? You yeah. have to be able to write a good politician. So you have to be able to summon the qualities that a good politician would have. You would have the There's wisdom. There's the benefit get, with that, though. Right? I, can, I can also manipulate how people respond to said politician and create the culture of said politician to be able to change it. So... <laughs> um, well, that's yes. interesting, right? Are you good or bad? So your cyberpunk stuff is mm. bad. You like we talked about this back when I was writing an apocalyptic tale. Yeah. And it made me think about destroying something because that's basically what you're doing. You're not building it up, you're tearing it down. Yeah. Do you want to write more positive futures or do you like dealing with the now, the darkness where human depravity is to come we can summon or whatever? I think while I understand the concept of a utopia and I see the draw to people writing utopia and I definitely have seen the benefits of writing hopeful fiction. I also think that the most hopeful fiction is dystopian fiction because you have to have hope to fight. Is that what the yeah. thing is? Yeah. But here's the thing is my mindset also, you have to understand that, that my viewpoint is that um, all people are capable of all evils. So I believe that the problem with the world is human beings. Like <laughs> we messed it up. You know, even if you look at kind of the psychology of people, you're like, you know, oh, your parents messed you up. Oh, your parents me messed you up. Like if everyone's a victim, eventually we're going to have to get to the point where there's someone who is not a victim and created a victim. Like you can't just have victims creating victims for eternity. There has to have be a perpetrator somewhere on there. Um, and uh, we've definitely pick, had our pick here in our society of who we consider that to be. Um, but yeah, so, so my viewpoint is that all people are capable of all evils. So, so when I look at a utopia, it's terrifying for me because I know that there is no perfectly polished utopia somewhere someone is creating victims and they're just hiding very well. Um, so I think that's kind of what pulls me away from utopia. And then on top of that, you know, I've, I've read the book Utopia, where the word utopia comes from. Um, a very interesting piece of work. The biography on the back end was much more interesting to me because I love that time period. Um, but it's so specific. And what uh, I, I believe Thomas More is the author, what he envisioned as a utopia to me sounds horrifying. What did he envision? Um, what was his deal with utopia? Nobody had any, um, any, it was an extreme of socialism and an extreme of um, actually socialism in some senses, but that, you know, so slavery was, was a tenant in his culture um, and racism definitely because of the mentality and the, the viewpoint. It was, you know, his view. He wrote it about South America um, and the idea that Atlantis was in South America. So then there was this pure white Atlantean culture surrounded by all of these <laughs> very, very racist viewpoint. Um, <laughs> surrounded by all these vicious natives who they needed to like teach their ways to by conquering them. Um, so on right. the one hand, he had this extreme socialist view where um, there were no religions and there were churches, but the churches were for the agnostics. Um, so there was no, they didn't teach about a God and they actively suppressed that viewpoint but they had a church for the agnostic, for those who wanted a vague spirituality. You also couldn't own anything. So anyone could walk into your house and take whatever they wanted because no one owned anything except for people um, because slavery was still in existence. So you couldn't own any property except for other human beings. 
Um, <laughs> it's interesting though, because he died, what, 1859, this is his Wikipedia page, and I, I knew anything about him before this. Um, he's also writing in the same time as Frankenstein, Mary Shelley and stuff, right? Didn't they know each other? No, Just look at Byron. He, was writing, he was writing during the Protestant Reformation. So um, this would be yeah, around the Enlightenment, I guess is what they would call it. Well, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein 1820. I'd have to look it up to be sure. I want to say she was more Victorian era. Nope, you would be wrong. She's 1820. I mean, it's okay. interesting. They're both, uh, you know what's also interesting about the era that they're writing in is that there was a mini ice age then. There was um, a volcano erupting in Iceland that covered oh, the, yeah. the Earth's atmosphere soot and it lowered the temperature. The year that um, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein was called the, 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 the year of no winter or no summer actually. So I mean, it's, it's fascinating. And the idea that he, an enlightened thinker thought it was okay to continue slavery. Right, as an yeah. Englishman, as an Irishman too, because yeah. Ireland was basically slaves to England at that point. Well, his mentality was that, and and this was he a Protestant. Um, he, was a he no, he started Catholic. going towards the Protestants for a while because he thought that they would create more freedom in a in a more agnostic type religion because he disliked the um, the the Catholic Church. But then as he got into the Protestant religion a little bit, he ended up disliking it and then went back to the Catholic religion and ended up slaughtering multiple Protestants. So oh, he was one of, one of the biggest persecutors of the Protestant religion. And even more, I mean, the England, I think, when did England get rid of the slaves? It was an early 19th century too. It was before us anyway. And they took uh, out a bond to do it and they just paid it off like a few years ago. Completely fascinating. That's that, interesting. That, like a person who existed then thought it was okay to be able to buy another human being and make them do work for you. Yeah. Well, I mean, his, <clears throat> his viewpoint, what he expressed in Utopia was that it was as a punishment for, um, for crime, which it's, it's interesting to think of. I see the benefit of it from a political standpoint, but not from a moral standpoint, if that makes sense. Well, do you know, American citizen, person that I'm talking to right now in Florida, one of the United States, <laughs> that the amendment that freed the slaves in this country made it illegal to own another human being, right? To force them to work for free, mm -hmm. unless, you're in pri unless you're a prisoner, unless you're a felon, then it's okay then they can do whatever the fuck they want with you because you're not a human being anymore. They can, you're basically a slave. So slavery never really ended in this country. It just became something <laughs> that they could levy on you as a prisoner. Yeah, no, slavery never ended. We have more slaves today than we ever did in history. It's just hidden behind certain... Words, terms, oh. contracts. I mean, um, that's a I, whole live, I live in New thing. York. I walk all over the place and see people that are working construction sites that... You know, I don't know. It's interesting how the blind eye gets turned in certain directions for the yeah. benefit of commercialism or capitalism or whatnot. Yeah, it's a sad, yeah. sad world. I mean, I think it's interesting that we live now because we get to see what's happening, whether we get to make any difference. At least we're writing about it, right? There's yeah. a truth in our fiction that's, that's going to stand out. Um, and I don't know. How long have we been talking about it? 55 minutes in or so? Yeah. Yeah, almost an hour. Uh, it's it's been fantastic. I really miss talking to you. We'll definitely invite yes. you back on going forward. Do you want anybody to know anything that you have coming out? You said Raven Trees today. Unfortunately, I probably won't get you out until Friday next week. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, on the third, the um, the complete collection is out, um, and I'm going to be celebrating that through the end of October. So um, if you head over to my website, um, and then quite a few clicks unfortunately but you go over to um, books and then under Raven Tree Society you should see a link um, to the promo page and uh, so I'm doing multiple giveaways uh, the candles that I talked about um, I'm doing the prints art prints um, and I'm doing ebook copies of all three seasons so the entire series um, right before Halloween so yeah it's a big promo there's a lot of stuff going on um, as far as like next year, I guess it just depends on when I finish my next books because <laughs> I'm getting to the end of what I have stocked up. Um, well, I have well, a 
we're going to think positively too. Do you think there yes. might be a place where you'll be setting up a, a live event or how will people know where to find you in the world if they want to be involved in a live event? Uh, it, it, it's hard to say exactly. I think well, I'm, I'm looking I guess I'm saying, at what would you do? <laughs> what would I do? Well, I think yeah. I'd, st- I'd like to start out with doing um, either a farmer's market or uh, a library event. I'll probably aim for a farmer's market and keep it nice and simple and not have to do like anything too extravagant like signings or cosplay or anything like that um, because people are scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the author. I, I went to a Jersey um, Comic Con and there was a bunch of dudes running around in stormtrooper costumes. Yeah, yeah. And my anxiety skyrocketed like you would not believe. I was so uncomfortable. You know, they had the blaster rifles or whatever. I was like, holy shit. They're just going to start shooting everybody. Any second now is going to turn out to be a freaking terrorist group or something. It's like, nope, we got to get out of here right now. Yeah. Yes. I can't even imagine that kind of. There's, yeah, that's an interesting perspective on that. It's definitely. Oh, God. I used to do too many movies, right? And then you couple that with current events. Yeah, no, I don't think I don't think that's an unrealistic fear. <laughs> so we'll um, but yeah. Anyway, um, I hope it all comes back. I hope things come back to normal. I really just, uh, it's unfortunate yeah. that we have to live through. I mean, we, uh, it always kind of was a mirage anyway, right? Yeah. It depends I mean, on what kind of mirage you want it to be. I, yeah, I, the world is what it is. Like if, as a Christian, my viewpoint is if the world was that perfect, what would we need heaven for? Um, so <laughs> I'm sorry for those who don't have that viewpoint, but um, I guess, yeah, you just find your joy where you can. Yeah, that's it, right? Yeah. That's the inevitable conclusion to everything, but you have to find something to hope for beyond it, whether that's yeah. your Christianity beliefs or something else, right? Spirituality yeah. is important. Yeah. And what we do, spirituality is important because it adds a whole other layer to everything. And everybody has it throughout history. Every human has looked at the stars or a rock and thought, there's something here. There's something that mystical, something amazing, something I need to bow to. You know, I need yeah. to genuflect to this thing because it's more important than me. There's a magnetic pull towards a greatness that I don't understand. I'm a mere mortal. Yeah, Maslow's hierarchy of, of uh, needs, which I feel like that's been debunked by now, but I might be thinking of something else. But um, I think it? the concept still has some merit. Uh, um, well, you know, again, thank you so much for um, being on. And uh, maybe I can get you out this Friday. I'll try really hard. I'll, yeah. bump, I'll bump Ted Weber. <laughs> well, don't worry about it. Uh, what comes, comes. And... and just putting word out there, you know, these books are out here for uh, the rest of my life. I don't have any ideas of pulling them down anytime soon. So I just hope you keep writing. That's what I want you to do is just keep writing because the writing is the most important part. Everything else is kind of grouped around it, but you get stronger and, you know, more competent and who knows what you'll do. Right. I mean, you just never know. You already have done great things. You've done the impossible. So keep doing good stuff. Yeah, 15 books. I, I am going to say I got Ben and Jerry's tonight to celebrate uh, the ending of 15 book series. I was thinking about it that way, even though they're short stories. So. <laughs> you did something and the accomplishment will help you go on to whatever. Yes. Write something Thank fantastical, you. right? Do a high yeah. fantasy with a princess and an ogre. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would not be a typical princess and ogre i will no do doubt. that right i mean i'd like to see it set on a polynesian island too that'd be oh, badass I, I am writing a polynesian fantasy hell yeah man that's that's awesome that's right up your alley it's perfect yeah yes someday right. i'll finish it well i want to hear about it when's that day gonna be so I'll, I'll schedule you for the podcast oh I don't even know. Right now, I'm just publishing it um, about 500 words at a time on my blog post. Oh, okay. Um, so um, I'm, I'm intending to finish it and publish it. My, my hope is maybe sometime next year in the fall is to put it out, but it's, it's to, not on brand. It's more of just a passion project. Project. good stuff. I like so. it. It does sound like it's on brand because I know you lived there, Marvin, 
Is yeah. It Cook Island? No, where was it? <laughs> I lived in Papua New Guinea, which isn't technically yeah. Polynesian. Um, it's not? It's, it's, uh, I thought what it was. Call it? Melanesian, Mel Melanesia, I believe, South Pacific. So um, it's right above Australia. So it's, there's a lot in common with the Polynesian islands because you come to think of it, a lot of this kind of stuff is arbitrary. So I, I actually see a lot of um, Asian, like someone, someone, one of my author friends from um, Philippines posted some pictures of some of her family in the Philippines. And I was like, that looks like my home. But yeah, so. Oh, it's interesting. I went to a uh, a Mormon-funded Hawaiian cultural park on yeah. Oahu when I visited there. Mm. And it was, they, they included Papua New Guinea. They had a Papua New Guinea section. Yeah. And it was a Polynesian celebration type thing. It was cool. So I love that culture. So that's, that's very exciting. I'll keep yeah. an eye out. I haven't seen any of your posts about that on Twitter. But, uh, yeah, I haven't posted one for a while. Um, okay. So just because I've been catching up with stuff.